This next elder has done so much work that when I was reading about him, I didn't even know where to begin. Um, the next person speaking is Imam al Hash Talib Abdul Rashi. He is, and excuse me for having to read, but as I stated, it's like a long, extensive list. So here's the Amir of the Majlis Ashura, which is the Islamic Leadership Council of the Metropolitan New York area. He is the Amir of the Harlem Shura, which is a coalition of seven mosques in Harlem the Imam of the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood in Harlem since 1989. He has been the chaplain of incarcerated Muslims in New York City and New York State prisons. And he has counseled Muslims and continues to counsel Muslims living with AIDS, as well as um, Islamic domestic violence victims. So as you can see, he has really been working with the people that are going through it the most. And it is my honor and pleasure to welcome Brother Imam al Hash Shalib Abdul Rashid. A'udhu billahi min ash shaitan ar rajeem. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. Wa ashadun Muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I seek refuge in Allah from Satan, the accursed devil. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. I bear witness that there is no God, no deity worthy of worship, except Almighty Allah. Glory be to him. And the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, to whom the Quran was revealed, is the messenger of Allah. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, peace be unto you all. Assalamu alaikum. As we uh, move along in our program tonight, I don't want to be lengthy, uh, but the whole purpose really of our uh, panel is so that you could take presentation one and put it with presentation two and put that with presentation three all the way until we get up to the panel discussion. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to each give you a portion of a very uh, complex picture. Today, let, let me just first again thank all of the organizers of this event. I want to thank Mumia, who upon hearing about Imam Jamil's medical condition and the attempt, as Sister Karima said, to assassinate him by medical neglect, Mumia called his coalition and told them, help Imam Jamil. And this is typical of how, uh, how Mumia has been his entire life. His entire life, since he was a youngster, thinking about others and seeing others as himself and vice versa. So I want to thank Mumia Abu Jamal and the members of the coalition to free him and all of you on um, and I thank you on behalf of the men and women the young people the children the elders of the mosque of Islamic Brotherhood we are now in our 46th year as an African-American Sunni Muslim congregation in the spirit and legacy of the Muslim mosque incorporated begun in 1964 by Al-Hajj Malik El-Shabazz Malcolm X. <laughs> Yesterday, throughout the city of New York and throughout America, there were commemorative events that were conducted 
remembering the tragic events of September 11th. Most people don't know, right here in New York, that when those events happened 13 years ago, on September 11, 2001, that the political prisoners in the prisons of New York that Brother Khaled Abdul Samad was just talking about, and you know, I'm talking about, say, Kuhu and Bashir and Abdullah Majid and uh, Anthony Abdul Jalil Bottom and all of the others. All of them on September 11, 2001, and these are, are members of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army, incarcerated in New York State prisons, upstate. All of them were taken out of general population and put in SHU, put in the box. And that's not commonly known. And I think uh, Sundiata stayed in the box the longest. They didn't let him out till almost the end of December. So here you have these American political prisoners. And I hope you realize that America's official position is there are no political prisoners in America. But we know better. So these brothers who were locked up before there was any such thing as Al-Qaeda or any of these other groups they were put in solitary confinement because the whole state went on a security alert as if those brothers could have had anything to do. They've been in prison be for, <laughs> since before those groups came into existence. Absolutely. Been there for decades. So the point is that that decision that was made by prison officials is indicative of the wrong-headed thinking that people in law enforcement continue to engage in the illogical logic, That's right. That's right. the illogical logic that they engage in when they're dealing with Muslim Americans of African descent. Now, particularly when those Muslim Americans of African descent, or as my brother and elder Long Bay Braff used to say, Muslim Africans of American descent. <laughs> Take your pick. Uh, you know. When they have, like the rest of our people, dedicated themselves to aspirational and operational pursuit of freedom, there are people in law enforcement from the local level to the federal level who deem them criminals. If you're a black person in America and you struggle for freedom, there's somebody in law enforcement that views you as a criminal. J. Edgar Hoover's first major assignment was the late and honorable Marcus Garvey. That's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Back in the days around uh, just after World War I, when the NAACP was run by white folks, The federal government put them under surveillance and considered them to be a quote unquote militant organization. So we live in a country that even though it talks freedom, when you take the talk seriously, law enforcement responds as if pursuit of freedom 
in any form is a crime. As we just saw in the streets of Ferguson. Here are community people, many of them young people, non-violently demonstrating against injustice in a country that lords non-violent demonstration, okay, that says, no, the only way you can struggle for freedom here is through non-violence. So the people say, well, all right, let's exercise our constitutional, civil, and human rights. And then they brought out the army on them. Well, we always said that the police was an occupational army in the community anyway. So they just proved the point for us. Now, whenever I think of September 11, I often think of Imam Jamil. And I think of the, what I call the hidden blessing in his incarceration. Because that's one thing that they cannot connect him with and say he has something to do with that. <laughs> No, not because he was already, you know what I mean? Because make no mistake, they would if they could. Now, Brother Khaled, Amir Khaled, Abdul Samad, he just um, said correctly that it's very important for this gathering this gathering of love, this gathering of solidarity, this gathering of aspirational and operational pursuit of freedom. It's critically important for this gathering to be aware of uh, the transformation of H. Rap Brown into Imam Jamil Abdullah al Amin. Here we are in the 21st century, and I have, you know, I'm a movement person, so I speak to movement people all the time, and I always hear people talking about him as if this was 40 years ago. They ask me, yeah, hey, Iman. It's Mumia calling in. Oh. Sorry, folks. Precedent, stay Mumia tuned. This room is loaded and everybody is thanking you for putting out the commentary that made the call and we all answered. So um, we want your thoughts on Brother Javel Ali.
the fact that all of these things are true. That is, the government, as it exists today, imperial, torturous, acting with complete impunity. If you agree with these things, you must also agree that the government is engaged in daily criminality today. Who can know these things and not protest it with all their power? So my message is greater. Hopefully, Right, right. in here because he don't hear. Okay, assalamualaikum. Okay, I just want to tell you that Imam Jamil and my family, our family, we send our love to you and we thank you for involving your troops. And your troops are fantastic. So, um, you know, we'll uh, continue to work together and, um, and make this a reality and to. Uh, get Imam Jamil his medical treatment and to bring him home and bring you home too. That's right. <laughs> hey, Maria, this is Suzanne. Here comes Estella Vasquez, Vice President of 1199. She wants to say a few words to you. That's right. Compañero Mumia, nuestra solidaridad, la lucha continúa. Brother Mumia, on behalf of the workers of 1199, our solidarity, the struggle continue, free all political prisoners. Uh, Mumia, this is your brother, Imam Talib Abdul Rashid. Salaam alaikum. Uh, Brother Mumia, I just wanted you to know that uh, we began this program as I began to speak. I did so on behalf of Muslims throughout America who are expressing our thanks to you for your own empathy with Imam Jamil. And our prayers are with you, just as our prayers are with him. And we would look forward to seeing both of you Walking the streets of America with us once again. May Allah bless you. Sally O'Brien. Hey, Mumia, how you doing? Hey, Sally. Hey, it's nice to hear you, but uh, you know, we're still waiting for you to come on out here and do some radio. You know, you're on the radio every yeah. week. <laughs> But we'd like to thank you for all of the wisdom that you give us every single week. That's right. It's inspired a lot of people to also record other political prisoners. And it's, uh, it's an infectious, uh, uh, wonderful communication. And so thank you very much for being 
the initiator of that, the first one. That's right. I have two youth that's coming up. Isabel is one, and one of the newer members of the New York Coalition to bring Momia home, um, Isabel. Hi, Momia. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, oh, oh. Wait, wait. It's speak so into the phone. So okay. Yeah. Just okay. Um, Impact just performed. Yes, right. Sorry, you couldn't hear it. Um, one of these days we're going to get you out here so you can see a show. We really want you to come see it. Um, okay. Remo oh, yeah. Mommy, does this remind you when Isabel came to visit you? She talked, you know, she talked up to the point she saw you, she lost words. <laughs> She's a heck of a worker, uh, Mumia. Still working for you. And all political prisoners. All he does. He, he should know. Like, Mumia, come on, I didn't want to. Mumia, you should know that the house is packed here. Yes, it is. This place is absolutely Come, come, you got to come over to the mic, sir. Mumia, we love you. We love you. Uh, as a young person, I can only say that we still listen to your words and that we read them and that we hear you when you speak and we want your body as free as your mind is um, because you are free in your mind. Then a lot of us out here. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for letting us know what's going on. Okay, what are your time looking like? A minute. A minute or two. Can I get someone older than me to come up here? I'm 67. Older than Suzanne. He was just here. I'm not. Okay, somebody please. 84, then come on, 84. Come on. Hurry, hurry. <laughs> This is a sister that's been out here. She got a police. We have another Oh my brother, you have no idea how glad I am to speak to you. I listen to you on the radio and you inspire me. And I've been a vegetarian 50 years so I could be here and know my name and social and say God bless you.
So I started off talking about 9-11 and the placing of our New York-based political prisoners in uh, solitary confinement. I talked about the attempt in America to criminalize the lawful pursuit of freedom. And you always understand there's a difference between an outlaw and a criminal. And I, I, I left off just before Brother Mumia called by reminding us of what uh, Amir Khalid Abdul Samad said about the kind of post uh, H. Rap Brown history. Listen, when Iman Jamil was incarcerated in 1971, from 1971 to 1976, in the prisons of upstate New York, he became a Muslim. He took Shahada, he became a Sunni Muslim, same way that Malcolm X took Shahada, same way that the rest of us who are Muslim took Shahada, Duruba, I could just, Safiya, Bukhari, I could just go, go down uh, the list. So there are a couple of things that happened with Imam Jamil that were not televised. His becoming a Muslim was not televised, although we in the Muslim community knew about it. In 1976, when he was uh, released after serving time in Attica and other prisons, he moved down to uh, Georgia. His wife told him, I'm in Georgia, you want me, you gotta move down south. <laughs> so he moved. And in 1976, he and brothers and sisters in Atlanta, Georgia, got together and they opened a mosque that they then called the West End Mosque. They became pillars of the community in the West End of Atlanta, in the hood, you understand? That's right. That's right. These are the same people who, you know, plain working class folk who during the sentence phase of Imam Jamil's trial came forward in large numbers and took the stand and defiantly railed at the court. You don't know him, we know him. That's our brother, that's our neighbor. 
that. We know what you, you know, these are people without college degrees, without even high school diploma, but people, we have a saying in Islam from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that says nobody knows a person like their neighbor. So Imam Jamil's neighbor, grassroots people, benefited from the work and the development of the West End Mosque. Again, was not televised. Then in 1983, a national network of African American Sunni Muslim mosques and congregations from the Dal Islam movement chose Imam Jamil as their Amir, as their leader. So this took the individual profile of Imam Jamil as an Imam over a congregation and made him an Imam over other Imams throughout America. And I guess when that happened, the uh, FBI and people said, you know, uh, got to start another file. Because part of Imam Jamil's uniqueness in the 21st century is the fact that he is a bridge leader, bridging activism and work in the 20th century with activism and work in the 21st century. And in so doing, in embracing what he refers to as the continuum of struggle and reaching out for young people as the young people caught up to him. He was rapping 40 years ago, so they caught up. And in his reaching out to young people in the street organization, as Amir Khaled said, that wasn't televised. And, and I hope you know that one thing that law enforcement fears is politicized street organizations. Come on, come on. Come on Our brother Felipe Luciano was here earlier. Every time I see him, I always remember that the Young Lords Party started off as a street organization. And they became politicized. So Imam Jamil, working away from cameras, away from rallies, away from public uh, uh, acclaim, was moving around America, enlightening, uplifting, and politicizing street young men and women of the street organizations not to overthrow America but to clean up their lives and to clean up the community and to bring peace to the community and he did this as the result of his evolved values as a revolutionary activist his evolved values we have a saying in Islam, you know, those of us who are Muslims, we know that Allah challenges us in the Quran. Allah says to us, what's the matter with you? That you don't fight in the cause of men, women, and children who are oppressed. That's a verse from the Quran. Imam Jamil embraced that. We have a saying in Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, when you see an evil, change it with your hand. If you can't do that, he said, speak out against it. If you can't do that, then hate it in your heart, resist it in your heart. Imam Jamil said, no, that's, that's the religion I want to be part of. In our faith, social justice struggle is looked at and believed to be a prophetic tradition. The Quran is a book that contains narratives of revolutionary prophets leading the oppressed masses of the people against the oppressors of their time. It wasn't just Moses, although it was Moses. So let me say in conclusion that in gaining an understanding of what has been done to Imam Jamil, and why 
it has been done to Imam Jamil. During his trial, came out that the United States government had 44,000 documents on Imam Jamil. Can you imagine that? What they do? They must have had a building, you know, <laughs> with files just on him. 44,000 documents. They produce, produce no wrongdoing. Undercover agents in the mosque. No wrongdoing. So they kept looking around and fishing around until they could come up with something. So you, we must factor all of this in. We must factor the dynamics of the post 9-11 world, not because uh, any of us are involved in any terrorism, but because of the power of Imam Jamil as a bridge figure, as a global bridge figure, with revolutionary leadership in the 60s, in the 20th century, with that uh, um, leadership in the 21st century. So I want to conclude by encouraging you to do a couple of things. I know you all have a copy of Die, Need to Die. I want to encourage you to get a copy of Imam Jamil's book, Revolution by the Book. That's the book. Hold it up. Turn it around. Read that one. And understand his evolution from H. Rap Brown to Imam Jamil Abdullah Alami. In your library, next to all your other books of uh, by, uh, uh, writings by leaders of the Black Panther Party, make sure you get Safiya Bukhari's book, The War Before and read what happened in her life to trigger her own evolution from Bernice Jones to Safiya Bukhari. I mean, we, we all mature enough now to understand that there are those of us in the community who are revolutionary but who also uh, practice religion. And that doesn't take away from anybody else's revolutionary fervor. We all in the same fight. But those of us who are people of faith, we just have an additional dimension in our fight. As Imam Jamil used to say to us, you will not be able to whip the devil without until you whip, uh, he used to say whoop. Uh, you will not be able to whoop the devil without until you can whoop the devil within. So as we proceed, as we proceed, having moved from the time of COINTELPRO to the time of OINTELPRO, yeah, right. you know, COINTELPRO stuff was covert. Now it's over. Yeah. It's the law of the land. And we all living up under this oppression. Uh, one last thing. That was in April 2008. NYPD intelligence document. Can I can I tell it, Suzanne? There's an NYPD uh, document, intelligence division document that was leaked. AP leaked it. You can go online and pull it up. It's a deputy commissioner's level intelligence meeting. They start off the meeting talking about African-American Muslims. And they say, quote, we are particularly concerned about our convert masjids. This, this is what it says in the report. And it names the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood, of which I am the imam, and it names a few other mosques. But, it, this, but here's the kicker. It doesn't express concern about any terrorism. It expressed concern over what they call, quote, Sean Bell rhetoric, unquote. Why is the intelligence department of NYPD concerned about us 
exercising our constitutional, human, and civil rights to oppose, to oppose being brutalized by the NYPD and being victims of excessive use of police force. Well, it becomes revealed when you read the rest of the intelligence report. See, now in all of the, the uh, post 9-11 hype, when the report hit the media, the only thing the report mentioned was, uh, I think it was the last paragraph, where they talk about a group of Muslim students who went on a white water rafting trip in upstate New York. You heard about that, right? Everybody heard about that. They didn't talk about the rest of the report. Because then, when you read the rest of the report, it talks about their surveillance of Malcolm X grassroots movement, war resistance league, this group, that group. It talks about everybody in this room. And the work that we've been doing. I was looking, the only thing I didn't see in there was cold peak, uh, pink. But they had who the, the people on the bicycles, uh, you know, the bicycle protest, they had them in there. So I said to myself, oh, 21st century manifestation of COINTELPRO. So when you go home, here's your last homework assignment from the teacher, Freedom 101. When you go home, go to the website of the Associated Press and pull up, I think it's April 2008 document, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So we need to understand that to keep Imam Jamil alive is to keep ourselves alive. That's right. To keep uh, Mumia Abu Jamal alive is to keep ourselves alive. That's right. Is to keep our struggle alive. It is the past to pass the struggle for freedom in America along generational lines. The people of America were oppressed over generations and they will only be freed through a process of generational struggle. May Almighty God, who we are, who are Muslims, we call him Allah. Other people call him Almighty God, they call him Dios, they call him Jah, they call him, call him Jehovah, they call him all kind of names. He is who he is. The God of the heavens and the earth and all things in between. We pray that he's blessed this gathering and bless us with the resolve to continue to struggle for freedom as long as there is breath in our bodies and then to pass on that breath to the next generation and the one after that and the one after that until the land is free. Peace be upon you. Salaamu alaikum.